Welcome everybody and welcome to all those who are uh, watching us on Facebook Live. Um, it's wonderful to be together and I'm just so glad to see everyone and to invite you to Israel with me. So let me tell you what I'm going to be doing over the next little while, couple of minutes, and um, what I'm not going to be doing. I am going to be um, taking you through what life in Israel is like um, from, I call this reflections of an outsider from the insider, from the inside, sorry. Um, because obviously I am not an Israeli and I do not live there year round. I did not make Aliyah. Um, and so my perspective is really one of an outsider who lives each year for two months of the winter, uh, Canadian winter at least, um, in Israel. Um, and because I speak Hebrew fluently, I have the unique opportunity to really experience life in Israel almost like an Israeli. And what I do while I'm there is I take a lot of really interesting photos of interesting faces, interesting people, interesting ideas, food, um, politics. And then I come back and I sort of like analyze them with you. So I'm gonna put the slides in the middle of the screen and I'm going to um, go through this with you, um, including my own analysis. Um, there's several um, different themes that I'm gonna be looking at. Um, and as again, as I said, this is not a travelogue. I'm not gonna show you all of the beautiful um, nature I could have showed you. And I, I did lead a wonderful congregational tour and this is not a travelogue of that tour. Um, in fact, there's only one picture, I think, or two pictures in the whole slideshow of people from the tour and anything we did on the tour, um, because that's another, we'll do our own slideshow just of the tour for the people on the tour. There's nothing more boring than sitting through the slides of somebody's tour, um, as I well remember from the days when we used to have those slideshows. Um, but what I really wanna do is introduce you to the eccentricities and the um, fun of being an outsider for two months and then the um, opportunity that affords me to be an insider. Um, first, let me begin just by also thanking Nick Guntz for being our technical manager tonight. I completely, completely um, uh, appreciate this. It means that I don't have to worry too much about uh, muting people, unmuting people and letting them in. So I'm gonna show you my slides and then I wanna open up for conversation. Um, when we're at that point, I'll let you know how we'll be able to unmute you so that we can have the conversation together. So at this point, I'm gonna share the screen and it's gonna be a full screen so you'll be able to see the, the uh, slides perfectly. Um, and there we go. All right. And if someone could just give me a thumbs up that they can see it very clearly on their screen right in the middle. Thank you, Dawn. I can see you and <laughs> you got the... Uh, the thank you prize. Um, so welcome to my Reflections of an Outsider from the Inside. It's one of my favorite programs to do each year when I come back. I paid a lot of attention to graffiti this year because there's nothing as um, expressive in Israel than the graffiti. Graffiti is all over. And one thing I find so interesting about the graffiti is that it's fearless. It, it will say lots of interesting things, um, and it's very critical and also very loving of Israel. So the very first slide is one of my favorite pieces of graffiti that I found. And if you notice, there's, um, it's a very interesting graffiti because it has the Jewish door and it has the Muslim crescent. And then it has one sect of Christianity and something else, and it doesn't have a, a cross. And um, it reminds me there's a t-shirt that goes around in Israel that says coexist. And then certain letters of that coexist t-shirt are a Jewish star, a crescent, and, and a cross. Um, but this one seems to suggest that in Israel, there's a sorry. lot more than just the three Abrahamic religions. Sorry, and terribly we, sorry to interrupt, Rabbi. Uh, the, the Facebook feed just crashed. Oh. I'm, I'm sorry about this. I'm starting up again. Okay. Uh, I don't know what happened. It just it just popped up. Um, shall I just st cl stop for a minute so we can get them back on? Because I know uh, there's it's, it's a, there, there should yes, people were watching on the Facebook stream. Um, okay, hold on. Um, sorry, everybody. Just I'm terribly sorry about this. Um, it's time. Let's see if we can see if we can let's see if it works. Um. Uh, 
This is the learning of technology, which is frustrating. Yes, I am terribly sorry about this. It's no, most okay. inconvenient. That's okay. Okay. Does it look like? Oh, it says live. It looks it like should, live. it should be live now. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay, we're back on Facebook. Hello, everybody. Sorry to have crashed you. So here's our first slide again. Um, I think it, it helps us place into context that Israel as a very secular um, community also has many, 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 many more than the three Abrahamic religions represented. And I think people were, um, this graffiti artist wanted to make sure that we knew that. Now, for me, it's all about, is it Jerusalem or is it Tel Aviv? And this is an ongoing um, competition between the two cities. If you want to see Israel as a religious holy site, as a place where there are many ruins and many religions represented and lots of religious experiences, then you need to be um, in Jerusalem. If you want to see Israel as a very modern, cosmopolitan, Western, um, secular, culturally Jewish place, then you need to be in Tel Aviv. Now, Israelis will say that Jerusalem is another country, or they will say it, Tel Aviv is another country. They just say, Zet Medina Acheret, when you're talking about one or the other. And it's a fun sort of competition. People will say, um, you know, Jerusalem is about kippot, Tel Aviv is about bikinis. Um, but the beauty of Israel is that it's both. And the beauty of Israel is that both of these cities um, are in opposition, um, both complete flavors of Israel. So this is one of my favorite signs that actually expresses this um, in perfect, in a perfect way. So there is a saying from the Bible that says, if I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand lose its cunning. Let my, root, my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth if I do not put you, Jerusalem, above all my greatest joys. And this, the thing about Israeli graffiti is that it does use verses from the Bible irreverently. Um, and it's part of the great graffiti art of Israel. So this says in Hebrew, Im eshkachech Yerushalayim, if I forget thee, O Jerusalem, and that's the way the verse in the Bible starts, Ze biglal Tel Aviv. It's because of Tel Aviv. <laughs> it's just the perfect way for us to see this competition between the two cities. Now, what does make Tel Aviv so uniquely Israeli and so uniquely um, Tel Aviv? -y? Um, and that are the, this is an example of, the, of these. These two signs give you an example. I don't know if you know that Tel Aviv is now considered next to Berlin the vegan capital of the world. Um, it depends on who you ask, but people say that somewhere about between 10 and 20% of all of Tel Aviv are people who are vegans. Every single restaurant in Tel Aviv will say vegan friendly. And I put this sign up because this wasn't a vegan restaurant. This was actually a hamburger joint. Um, but the difference between, for example, Jerusalem and Tel Aviv would be that in Jerusalem, it would say kosher. And in Tel Aviv, it's going to say vegan friendly. And if you looked at the slide to your left, it's really a special piece of graffiti. So again, we take Torah verses and we play with them. So you can see this is a very provocative picture of two men kissing and they are Hasidic. You can see from the strimal, and you can see from the side curls, the peyot of the one on the right, and the strimal or the hat on the one from the left. Also, he has a big beard. Now, okay, it's very provocative to see two Hasidic men kissing, but the verse from the Bible underneath makes it even more fantastic. The verse from the Bible underneath says, Ve'ahavta l'reacha kamocha, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So look at what we do. We take that verse, we spin it on its head, and we say to Israeli society, this graffiti artist says to Israeli society, listen, you can't have it both ways. If you want me to love my neighbor as myself, then I have to be free to love who I want. 
And if I'm free to love who I want, then all sectors of society, religious and secular, have to be free to love whoever they want. And this, of course, you should know that this graffiti is very provocative, very controversial, and uh, very popular. We saw it in several different places uh, in the streets of Tel Aviv. Now, yes, we were there right before the third election. And before I finished um, preparing this slideshow, I want to just tell you the truth, that the name of this slideshow was the crazy, I'm sorry, the name of this slide was the crazy third election. But I did take that down because um, Israeli politics are extremely complicated and extremely interesting. You know, there are um, many, 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 way too many parties. The parties amalgamated into blocks. Um, and you must get an, a majority to to be in the government. And you know some of these, you know some of these faces, you know some of these names. But what was so interesting was the spin campaign. Now remember, I was there in January and February. The election was March second. We actually left on March second, or I think the election might have been March third. I might be, I, I might be confusing it. I mean, we actually left. Um, it was a day off for Israelis. Israelis were in the main exhausted from both the campaigning and from the fact that it was a third election. <clears throat> Many Israelis we spoke to were not planning to vote. Many Israelis we spoke to uh, were planning to take the day off and go to the beach or go somewhere else. Um, it was before coronavirus um, because it was a day off of work and a day off of school in the middle of the week, which for Israelis who work a six day week, they do not have a five-day week. Remember, they work on Sundays. Sundays is a regular work day in Israel. To get a day off in the middle of the week was really phenomenal. In fact, if I remember correctly, the, the election was on a Thursday, and so it made a long weekend. So I knew Israelis who were very politically active, very politically astute, and very politically involved, who said, the heck with this third election, we're going to Cyprus, right? Which is just a hop, skip, and jump away by airplane. Um, great beaches, Greek food, you know, um, and they were not staying around. As a result, you saw what happened with the election. It was pretty insane. What I want to show you is just some of the election signs, which were so interesting. So Lieberman had a, had a spin campaign that he is the liberal, he is the secular Jew, but he will guard the rights of everybody. So this says Lieberman will guard a liberal Israel. So we can't, we shouldn't think of the liberal party the way we think of the liberal party in Canada because that's not the name of one of the parties. Now, here's some of my favorites. So we'll start from the upper right. Um, Netanyahu, Liga Acheret. Netanyahu is another league, and of course, with Trump. So you can, you can um, interpret that however you wish. Right underneath it, right underneath it, um, you see this very provocative um, election campaign sign. It says, Rak yamina chazaka tidag lahachil ribonot. Only a strong right wing will get us where we need, will worry about um, our greatness, uh, continuing our greatness. But what I really want to concentrate is in those first three words. We need a strong right wing. Now, I want you to look very carefully at that election sign. To the right, you see Likud, you see Netanyahu, um, and you see that's the right wing. To the left, you see the word in red, smola, which means the left. And if you look very carefully behind the word smola, you see a Palestinian flag. And so it's right behind the word smola. And so basically this sign um, was saying, if you elect the left wing, you elect Palestine. So this was a very provocative campaign. There'll be more coming in a moment that get even more provocative. Upper left, you have Rak Shas Chazaka Timna Hitbolerud. Only a strong Shas party 
which is the right-wing religious party, can prevent or stop or um, stop the role of assimilation. Only a strong Shas party, only a strong religious right can um, slow down, slow down the effects of assimilation. So the, the, the um, election becomes not only a political arena, but it becomes a religious arena that you have to elect Shas if you want your children to marry Jews. If you, you have to, you want to elect Shas if you want there to be less assimilation of Israelis. I don't know exactly what that means. I think Israelis know what that means, which is there won't be theaters open on Shabbat, there won't be traffic allowed on Shabbat, there won't be public transportation on Shabbat. Um, and that's what we that's that that's what we need. That was coming from Shas. And the Shas party right underneath it has, of course, a picture of the Sephardic chief rabbi, which is very important because the Shas party um, attracts or tries very hard to pull in the Sephardic, um, the Sephardic population, even though they aren't in the main ultra-Orthodox, they're more modern Orthodox. This was the most provocative sign or um, uh, campaign poster. Um, it was so provocative that it was actually taken down, but I did get a, uh, take a picture of it. Um, and it says, you have to vote for um, this particular party. So that there will not be a child with two fathers. In other words, so that there will not be legalized homosexual marriage or legalized homosexual adoption of children. And then the bottom next to the name of the party, it says, Ohavim et Yisrael, we love Israel. Yehudit, chevratit, yiminit. These three words, we love in Israel, which is Jewish, um, warm and communal, and right wing. Very interesting. And now you see the Arab joint list. And I love this sign because first of all, many, 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 left-wing Israelis or even centrist Israelis voted for the Arab parties this time. Not because they wanted there to be an Arab majority in the Knesset, but because they believed that the only way to um, control the creeping um, right-wing um, anti-Arab sentiment was to make sure that the Arab parties got enough seats in the Knesset. And of course, on the left, you can see um, the Arab party in Hebrew letters and um, uh, Arabic letters together. It's called the joint list. Um, uh, and on the right though, what I love this so beautifully is it says in Hebrew only, ani shotef. That means I am participating. Now you can analyze that however you want, but it's a very strong statement from Arabs saying we are now going to see ourselves as part of this country, and we are going to um, participate. I am a participant um, yeah, as part of the Arab list. I'm going to tell you something. Bibi is loved, loved, loved by the Russian population. So I was not surprised to see babushka dolls um, with Bibi on them. It was just one of the funny things happening. Uh, there were lots of protests and lots of rallies, and we tried to, to take pictures and go to them. This is my favorite sign from one of them. This is a woman holding up a sign. It says, Am nivchar bocher manhig yashar. The chosen people, or more likely she means here, a people who thinks of themselves as chosen will choose an upstanding leader a leader without um, scandal. It's just a very, it has a beautiful cadence, Am nivchar bocher manhig yashar. But it's also a beautiful idea because if you take the word for the chosen people and the word for to elect or to choose, they're the same root. So the chosen people must choose a leader that 
is deserving to be the leader of that people. So those were the elections. Now, the day before the congregational tour started, um, I had the privilege of going to Bethlehem, the West Bank, um, and that was a, an eye opener. We did have a Palestinian guide who was very honest with us. I'm sure people from the tour can tell you more who was very, very honest with us and very critical and very clear about his politics. But it didn't matter to me so much what he said. What mattered to me were the signs in Bethlehem, which were very clear. Now, I want to say that I'm not putting this in this section for any nefarious reason. I'm not putting this in to be anti-Arab or pro-Arab or anti-Palestinian or pro-Palestinian. I'm putting this in because I want us to feel the difference between Tel Aviv and Bethlehem, the difference mostly between Jerusalem and Bethlehem. I need you to understand that Bethlehem is a 20 minute bus ride from Jerusalem. It is that close. You can walk from Jerusalem, from the closest point to Bethlehem, to Bethlehem. Um, and so they live side by side, and yet the realities of those two cities are absolutely positively different. So without um, making statements here, I wanted us to experience for a moment what it felt like to cross that border. Now, there actually wasn't a border crossing for us. We all brought our passports and all of that, but at no point did we have to show them. Depends on the day. Sometimes it can be very rough to, to travel and sometimes not. For tourists, mostly it's easy. Um, but when we got there, if you look at the sign on your left, you see, welcome to Palestine, welcome to Bethlehem. It's very clear that you are in Palestine. And while Israeli settlers might think that they are living in Israel, it is clear um, that Bethlehem is Palestine. And of course, Israel go home. That was the sign that welcomed us um, as we entered. And we walked around and we went to a very, very interesting refugee camp called Ada, A-I-D-A, -A, which has been in existence since 1948. And while it is right in the middle of Bethlehem, so it is not a refugee camp in the classic sense of the word, they have decided, the residents of Ada, have decided that they will classify themselves as refugees and they will classify their living uh, city um, as a refugee camp, although it does not function in any way, shape, or form as a refugee camp. Um, it functions as a city. Um, so, for example, they do not vote in Bethlehem elections. They are not governed by Bethlehem um, government. Um, and so they, they wish to remain a refugee camp um, for political reasons, for um, identification as refugees. They do not want to give up ever their right to, to identify themselves as refugees. And we ask them, if there is a Palestinian state, um, will you consider yourselves Palestinians? And that's a difference between consider themselves refugees. So until there's a Palestinian state, they will not uh, be residents of Bethlehem. Um, they will be refugees. So on the left, Intifada till victory. It's a little weird to see the Russian sickle next to it. Um, and to the right, this is a schoolyard um, in Bethlehem with a map of Palestine which of course is the map also of Israel. So it was, a, it was a little bit of a shock and important for us to see what people in Bethlehem, 20 minutes from Jerusalem, are experiencing in their lives. And people ask me now, how is the economy? So I think the answer to that question cannot be better said than these two slides. <laughs> so the slide, those of you who know Hebrew are already laughing. The slide on the right, you know how we have dollar stores here, right? And it's the sign on the stores is everything one dollar, right? So in Israel, they have 10 shekel stores, right? But this store was making a political or economic statement, and it says, Pachot me'elef. Everything in this store is less than a thousand shekels. So its idea was trying to say the economy here is so bad, so complicated, that you can't buy anything anymore for less than a thousand shekels. But the graffiti on the left is really, really profound. So if you look on the top, you can see a hay 
the Hebrew letter hey with a little bit of a slash or a dash. And that is the way that people write God, Hashem. Hey with a little chechik is the way that people write God. And now look down how the how the image of the religious word for God turns into the symbol on the bottom of the shekel. God becomes the shekel. We worship money. And the graffiti artist was trying to tell us that we have, we have turned God into the shekel. And we have to be careful with how we see ourselves economically. Very interesting stuff. All right, what in everyday life is uniquely Israeli about Israel? A couple of fun slides here. First of all, this is a table of Kipot. Every one of them is a team from the United States. Oh, there's probably some Canadian teams in there too. Um, and to me, the idea of a team Kippah is the answer to what makes Israel uniquely Jewish. And that is this combination of putting a kippah on your head, which is a symbol of being in one way or another Jewishly identified. And yet that symbol has a sports team on it, and back to Hashem and the shekel there. Um, that team has a, that, that kippah, which is a religious symbol, has a sports team on it, says one of two things. I don't take this so seriously, or I take sports as a religion. <laughs> <laughs> or isn't it cool that our religious garments can be secularized, if you will, um, so that we have fun and we, we feel good about wearing them? To me, this table is uniquely Israeli. Now, there is nothing more uniquely Israeli than a pita baker with his cigarette hanging over the pita and the ash about to fall on the bread that I'm about to buy. If that's not Middle Eastern, nothing is. And to the right, you see this beautiful picture, but I want you to pay very close attention to the details of it. So you see almost three generations of an Ethiopian Jewish family here, more just walking in the street. And you get the mom, or maybe actually the grandmother, I think, in full traditional Ethiopian regalia. You get the daughter, my guess is the mother, still with a head covering, still covering her hair, and still wearing the white Ethiopian scarf around her neck, but the rest of her clothing is Western. She's got a Western jacket, a Western skirt, and Western boots. And then behind them, behind grandma, is the grandson, completely Western clothing. So to me, this really represents the generational um, ethnic reality of what happens in Israel uh, to ethnic communities as they become more and more um, integrated. So what do I love most about the Israeliness of Israel? Upper right, orange trees in front of your apartment building for the taking. You just can reach up, pluck an orange and have it for lunch. We had lemon trees in front of our apartment building. This picture is from Jaffa. So you know the famous Jaffa oranges. So Jaffa has planted rows and rows and roses, rows and rows and rows, sorry, of orange trees along the streets. Um, and anybody can take the oranges. Underneath that picture is the quintessential Israeli experience of food and that is Stuffed vegetables are an Israeli, actually an Arab food that is very typical, very typical Shabbat food, especially in Sephardic families. But why should I have to hollow out all my own zucchinis? You can go to the market and only in Israel can you buy pre-hollowed zucchinis so you can easily stuff them. And this picture of old doors and windows just struck me. I thought, this is the old and the new to come together in Israel. So much respect and use of the old um, while we're still making it look new. While we were there, there was um, a whole kafafel about Nama. 
So Nama, as you remember, was a young Israeli who was caught in Russia with drugs, and then she was um, uh, incarcerated there, and Israel was trying to get her out. There was a lot of comparison to Gilad um, Shalit, trying to get our kids home, and hashtag we want Nama. And it, the country was very divided about this um, situation, because half the country said, you know what? She deserved to be in prison, she was smuggling drugs. And half the country said, it's not really fair. Um, she was put in there because she's Israeli and overly punished and the punishment wasn't fair and we want her to come home and we want all the government to pull out all the stops to get her home. She did come home, well, she did come back to Israel while, while we were there. She was given a hero's welcome. Not all of Israel agreed with that hero's welcome. On the upper right, one of the, Quintessentially Israeli experiences is seeing the cranes. So at the end of February, Israel experiences thousands and thousands and thousands of cranes. They are these huge, noisy birds. And they fly over um, up north of the, in the Hula Valley. And we were very lucky to have some in our backyard in the place that we stayed up north. And on the bottom right is a quintessential Israeli experience as well. If you go to a restaurant in Israel, it will be very unusual if you do not get offered a shot of ouzo at one point in the evening by a lovely waitress who will say, who will be singing or shouting or saying, l'chaim to everybody. She will have a shot with every table. And that is a very typical and normal Israeli experience. Three wacky and wonderful things. On the upper right, if you read Hebrew, I want you to read what the Hebrew says. Try and figure out, I don't know. Nick, do we have the chat function on? Because I can't get to it. Uh, yes, chat should be working for everybody. Okay, can I ask you, because I can't get to the chat function, um, can I ask someone to put on the chat function what they think what they think the word on the right next to food says. And Nick, you read it out. Uh, two people have said drugstore. Correct. So here's, here's modern Hebrew. What is the word for drugstore in Hebrew? It should be Beit Mirkacha. No, no, no. The word in modern Hebrew for drugstore is drugstore. But it's very funny that it doesn't say that in English. It says food. Um, on the bottom, you're gonna see something that only an Israeli could have invented. This is called Belgian falafel. Now, it looks like a waffle on the outside, doesn't it? That is falafel balls in the shape of a waffle, and everything you would put in your pita, you now put in the falafel waffle. Your salad, your tahina, your pickles, your fries. It's a gluten-free, um, it's a gluten-free falafel, and we just were very taken by it. And on the left is a slapped onto a, a poster of some sort, but I love it. It says, friend, you haver atatsofer, zelo ozer. It's great Hebrew. Friend, you are pressing on your horn, and it's not helping. Just a reminder of Israeli drivers. Now, where else would you see a fully dressed chassid with a fully dressed Hasidic puppet singing Hasidic songs, <laughs> miming um, Hasidic songs on the street? Just thought this was such a great sight. And a very important window. So this, um, this window has both Hebrew and um, uh, Arabic signs. So I don't know if in this house, it's a Palestinian Arab uh, Israeli family. I don't know if it's a mixed family. I don't know if they're Israeli Arabs, but all of the signs say the same thing. It's enough. Enough violence, no more violence. We've had it up to here, Ad Khan, meaning we've had it up to here. We have to live together. So when you see signs like this, just walking in people's windows, it's sort of like what we see today, people thanking the healthcare providers from their windows. 
it does make you feel very good. My absolute favorite piece of graffiti I saw in Israel was this one. On the bottom, it says, Ein Aravim, Ein Humus. <laughs> if, if you want to get rid of all the Arabs, there'll be no more Humus. So it's no Arabs, no Humus. And it's, you know, it's poking fun at a number of things. It's poking fun, it's poking fun at uh, a right-wing anti-Arab slogan, um, without Arabs, there's no terror, right? Without Arabs, there's no intifada. It's poking fun at that. It's also poking fun at all of the American um, anti-immigrant, um, xenophobic stuff that Israelis also listen to and imbibe that seems to suggest you know, how Americans were saying, if all the Mexicans leave, there'll be no gardeners. There'll be no people to do the work that Mexican people tend to do. So this, without Arabs, there's no hummus. No Arabs, no hummus, is a very, um, very interesting way to poke fun at that idea. Now, there are some things you see in Israel that you only see in the Jewish state. Honestly, they are so interesting and unique. On the left, this elderly um, gentleman, his job is to go from store to store on Friday, hanging up these signs. These signs say, can you see up in the way up in the upper left-hand corner on the green piece of paper, 458? You can see those numbers. So this sign says, candle lighting tonight is at 458. So, and by the way, this was not in Jerusalem, this was in Tel Aviv. <laughs> So you always know what time to light candles on a Friday. Um, of course, the kosher certificate, which in this particular case was very looking like it needed to be renewed. It's pretty old and gross looking. And then this is a sign over a building that I think, especially City Shul can relate to. Ilufinu, male shira kayam. If our mouths were filled with praise as the song of the sea. It's really special to see that just walking by. Now, where else in Israel would you see a picture of the Babi Sala? He is the great Rebbe, if you will, of the Sephardic Moroccan community. He is the great uh, miracle worker and um, guru, if you will, um, pouring himself a glass of Arak and um, giving us permission to enjoy our Arak. And this sign, it was in a falafel place. So basically it was the falafel owner's way of saying, you should buy an arak, it's okay because the babisala um, allows it. On the left, you see napkins in a uh, restaurant that say batavon, good appetite. It would be like us having a napkin that says bon appetit, but it's just so sweet to see it in Hebrew. On the upper right, you're in a supermarket, and above you at the cashiers is a verse from Yirmiyahu, a verse from the prophets. For you will eat and you will be satisfied. I just love that in the middle of the supermarket. And then um, on the bottom, really, City Shul, you got to pay attention to this. We're walking, we're walking. Uh, in the street, this was also in Tel Aviv, and we see this big, big, big sign on a synagogue. It says, Kahal Kadosh, holy congregation, or holy friends, holy brothers and sisters. Anu chayavim l'shapetz et bet knesset. We are needing to make renovations or repairs on our synagogue. Please make a donation, and you see the arrow for the kupa. Please make a donation to the renovation of our synagogue um, right now, and you will be you will receive for this a blessing. I don't know. I'm thinking about putting this big thing up there that people can put money in every day. Upper right hand corner. You go to the dry cleaners in Israel. Is there anything missing from this picture? Anybody notice the colors in this picture? This 
clean dry cleaners is in a religious neighborhood and everything he dry cleans is either black or white. No colors anywhere in this dry cleaner. Underneath, I love that Chabad felt that it had to be in a place where there was so little Jewish life. You know, they just felt like they had to um, welcome all Jews to experience Judaism in Rechavia. Rechavia is a main neighborhood in Jerusalem. I just felt, wow, you really, you really missed out here if you think that you need to be in Rechavia because there's not enough Jewish life. And on the left, my favorite Purim costume that we saw in a store window. You too can get dressed up as a Sefer Torah. Very hard to find that in Toronto. Of course, you see religious mannequins in Jerusalem. What fun. First of all, on the right, you can see this is a, a scarf store and you can see all the different ways that women wear scarves. In the middle is a, is a store where the little girl on the right, the little mannequin girl, is wearing a black hooded thing. And on the left is just a store with religious mannequins, which I love. There are tzedakah boxes on every corner in Israel. Look at this. You just can go anywhere and give tzedakah on the street. And on the bottom, of course, this is the, um, at night when the marketplace closes, this is a nut seller. When the marketplace closes and they bring down their um, metal uh, guard, I guess, guard door, um, they've all been painted. But I just think the painting of Moses with the Ten Commandments uh, says something about the marketplace that's uniquely Jewish. On the upper right, where do we see in Toronto people just hanging out and playing shesh bish? I don't know what that's called in English kind of a checkers game. On the bottom right, the same day, a um, protest against the closing of some LGBTQ um, community centers. And on the left, just a piano bar in the middle of Tel Aviv. Okay, where else but in Israel would you have to put a sign on your wine if it's not kosher? That is fantastic. So you see the blue, what I, I put in blue for you, so you can see it, low kasher. Like you need to know that the wine is not kosher. Not that you need to know that it is kosher. On the bottom left, where else but Israel, is there a gender alternating beach? Now, I wonder sort of what that means. Does that mean that if you uh, present as a male on Monday, you can go in on Mondays and present as a woman on Tuesday. You can go in on Tuesday. I don't think that's what they meant. I don't think they're that hip. This is a separate gender segregated beach in, uh, in Tel Aviv. I just need to tell you guys the best part of this beach. It is right next door to the gay beach. I think they don't know that. They haven't figured it out yet. Um, Above that picture, one of my favorite things in Tel Aviv right now is these are benches, and this is truly a Jewish state. In the middle of the bench, there's a table for you to put your food down so that you can sit on the bench and not have to eat on your lap. This is a nation of Jewish mothers who are always worried that you should be able to eat. And of course, on the right, a water tower with a menorah on the top. There is nothing Nothing that says Israel more to me than the word balagan, which means a mess, a chaos, craziness. But this is the balagan Asian market, which means that by now, the Asian people who have moved to Israel and opened up this market know that the word balagan is the national word of Israel. I just think that is a terrific example of ethnic um, assimilation, ethnic acculturation. This is called what the heck section. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been to Israel a lot and I have never seen so much Christmas stuff. It used to be very, very unusual to see any Christmas decorations in Israel at all. Um, and we saw them all over Tel Aviv. 
They used to be only in the Russian sections or the Russian stores because Russians have a very long and celebrated, uh, Russian Jews, history of having Christmas trees, which they call winter trees, which are usually put up in January, not in, even in December. But we have, we felt that along with Valentine's Day, um, Tel Aviv is, is, is embracing a secular understanding of winter holidays um, to include Christmas. We found it very interesting. In my what the heck section, upper right, home of the BLT, and that means BLT. This is a restaurant that's very proud to serve bacon. On the bottom right, it's not that it's called We Love Plants, and it's not that it's called the Urban Plant Shop. It's just that there was absolutely no Hebrew on this entire window. No Hebrew at all. You see opening hours, Sunday to Thursday, we love plants, urban plant shop. There's a store in Tel Aviv with now a single Hebrew letter on its front. And of course, who is the proud goy? I don't know, but I thought that's, that, that graffiti artist had something to say. This, my friends, is a real what the heck experience. I don't know how much you know, but there is this, about this. There's a very small, very marginal sect of uh, ultra orthodox Haridim whose women wear the burqa. They wear a full black, including a face mask with only the eyes open. And it has many, many layers, as you can see from the woman on the left. It's very hard to get a picture, and it's very unusual to see these women on the street. Very unusual. This was actually just uh, after I had come from the Western Wall. It was right outside the Western Wall, um, and I could not believe I actually saw one of these women from the sect, and I was like, I have to take a picture. So I couldn't get close, and I did the best I could. Um, but you can see her hand is visible because she's actually on a cell phone, which I thought was incredibly weird. But you can see that she's wearing a full black scarfy thing on top of another black shirt, on top of another black layer, on top of a long black skirt. So she's got at least four or five black layers on. Her face was completely covered, completely covered. You could only see her eyes. And you can see better on the, um, on the photo on the right. Now, when I first saw her, I said, oh, this must be an Arab woman. But then I saw that she was walking with her Hasidic husband, as you can see on the right. So I knew then that this is a member of this very, very right wing, very marginal sect. I want you to know it's very small and um, very much misunderstood and very much maligned and um, very problematic. And the Israeli government is watching them very carefully. We saw an, an exhibi exhibition in the Israel Museum about this cover up, covering up of Jewish women, which is, they're actually called the Jewish Taliban, um, derogatorily. Um, and I saw this picture that I wanted to show you. Now, this is not anything I saw. This is a photograph from the exhibit in the Israel Museum about these women. You can see a better, um, you can see how fully covered this is the Jewish woman is. But what's so interesting about this fantastic photo, this was taken in Mea Sharin in the ultra-Orthodox Haredi neighborhood. You see the two ultra-Orthodox women taking a picture of this woman and looking at her like she is crazy. So imagine if an ultra-Orthodox woman is looking at this super, super, uber ultra-Orthodox woman and saying, that is too far. And my last, uh, in, the, in the what the heck section, is um, in Tel Aviv, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of Thai massage. Um, it's very popular. And a lot of Thai people who come to Israel um, are Thai masseuses. Uh, on the left, you see an advertisement for, I just like to juxtapose these. You see an advertisement for rooms by the hour right? The most beautiful rooms in Israel, it says, that you can rent by the hour, and then a little ahava on the bottom for love only. 
Um, and then on the right, when we went in to get a Thai massage, the sign that welcomed us, massage only. Don't get any other ideas about what is going on in this massage parlor. I want to take you to Women of the Wall. I was there twice, once for Shvat and once for Adar, the Hebrew month of Shvat and the Hebrew month of Adar. Every month that we go there is different. Sometimes it is difficult, sometimes it is challenging, sometimes it is beautiful, sometimes it is spiritual. It is different every month. Those of you who know about Women of the Wall know that they are an organization that has been for the last 30 years trying to get the right for women to pray at the Western Wall and the women's side of the Western Wall in Talas and Tefillin with a Torah. Three T's, Talas, Tefillin, and Torah. They come in every month on Rosh Chodesh, on the new moon, with Talas and Tefillin, and they try and get a Torah in. About 70% of the time, the Torah is turned away by the guards, and they cannot get the Torah in, and they do not get to read from the Torah. Both months I was there, which is huge, the Torah got in. Now, when I say the Torah got in, I want you to understand the Torah is this big. It is tiny. It is the tiniest Torah I have ever seen. And it is snuck in somebody's shoulder bag. And so since you have to put everything through a metal detector and put everything through a x-ray machine, it often gets caught. Sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes a man will bring it in and pass it to the women over the wall. Sometimes a man will bring it in and give it to them in the plaza. I don't know how it got in. We are never told. We're never told if it got in, how it got in. We, are, we cannot know. Um, but pretty much every month, young Orthodox boys like this or young Haridi boys like this are shouting at us, greeting us, and making us feel welcome. Um, the month of Shvat was amazing. It was the quietest, most beautiful month I've ever experienced. I wanted to show you these two pictures because I want you to understand that it's not reform, women of the wall. It is multi-denominational. However, it's mostly reform, conservative, a smattering of modern Orthodox women. But Orthodox women definitely um, obstruct us. They do not want us there. So on the left is a picture of this all in black woman. Um, and she comes every month trying to convince women of the wall not to come. And this is a beautiful picture because the woman on the right with her hand around her is one of the organizers of women of the wall. She is a reform cantor. And she just takes this woman with all her anger and all her rage, and she just puts her hand around her and just walks down to the Western wall with her saying, I hear you, but we're still gonna do it this month. I hear you, but we're gonna pray this month. You're welcome to join us if you want. And she defuses all this woman's rage. It's quite extraordinary to watch. And the picture on the right is the woman who was standing next to me the whole time. She is clearly religious. She is clearly not modern Orthodox. You can tell from the beehive level of her, um, of her uh, head covering. This is a very, by the way, that head covering is a symbol of being quite Haridi. Um, she stood next to me with her own prayer book the whole time in the circle of these women. And I kept wanting to ask her, are you really praying with us or are you praying against us? She was doing her own little Orthodox service, but she was standing and praying with us. And I thought to myself, if you're praying with us, you're making a statement, which is, I want to be like this, even though I can't. So I'm just gonna, or she was praying against us, praying for our souls, I do not know. So what also um, greets us almost every month on the left is this woman who wears what appears to be a talus, but it's not, it's just a white sheet. And it says, I will cover myself in sackcloth and ashes. On the upper right, can you see the woman with the glasses sort of peering over? She is a woman that screamed at us the entire service, just screamed at us the entire time. And on the bottom right, what, what greeted us for the first time, and I think this was in Adar, was hundreds, hundreds of religious schoolgirls who had all taken chairs and made rows so that there was no room for us to stand as a group. Now remember, there's 100 or 200 of us, so you need a lot of room for all of us to stand, but they had taken up the entire wall so that we did not have room. But in Shvat, the Torah got in. And I had an aliyah to the Torah 
at the Western Wall for the first time in my life. And you need to understand what that means because when I've lived in Israel for a full year, I went every single month to Women of the Wall. And I had never been able to be there when they have a Torah and have the Elias. So you can see it was very emotional for me. And in Adar, the Torah got in and Sidi Shul was there. And I had, you can see how small the Torah is on the left hand side. And I got to read from the Torah at the Western Wall for the first time in my life. It was fabulous. And you can see how happy I am. And I'm leading all of the women from the tour behind me. Come on, let's just go, let's just go. We had a great moment and we got to plow through. And what do we have to plow through? The people on the right. So you can see what greets us as we come out of the Western Wall. They used to have these signs literally in the Western Wall Plaza. They've been now disallowed from that. They must have the signs outside the plaza. So when you leave the plaza, you're already going to your bus, you're outside of the Western Wall. These signs um, greeted us. Reform denies the Torah and all Jewish traditions. So they, so the ultra-Orthodox have decided that women of the wall is reform. It doesn't matter whether they are, we are or not. But the second sign is my favorite. Reform is not religious. Well, hello, yeah, we never said we were. Um, but what's important is for you to know it in Hebrew. So the top says, Tnuat HaReformim, the movement of reformists, not reform, movement. The movement of reformists, Enena Tnua Yehudit. It is not a Jewish movement. So while in the English they put reform is not religious, in the Hebrew they put reform is not Jewish. And here's our little group that went to the Western Wall and had that amazing experience. And here's the men who came to support us. They stood behind us, um, just watching from behind from the women's section. So I did go to three amazing projects this year that I wanted to introduce you to. The first is Lift Up Your Heads Ministry, which is a Nigerian church that takes care of all of the African refugees. Um, they feed them, they clothe them, and they sleep there. It, uh, reaches out to about 500 African refugees every single day and every single Sunday. And this um, pastor's wife um, cooks the Sunday meal for 500 people in their own house. Um, the middle, as you can see, is a fabulous kind of olive oil. It's called Sindiana. It is a Palestinian, Israeli, women-owned olive oil collective in the north. You can buy their olive oil from Amazon when things get back to normal. It's called Sindiana, S-I-N-D-Y-A-N-N-A. -N -N -A. And you can buy extra peaceful olive oil, extra hopeful olive oil, extra positive olive oil, and extra unified olive oil. And it's a terrific project. And the project on the left is Cucinate. Cucinate is a weaving collective that teaches African refugee women to weave beautiful, amazing baskets. And it was a privilege to see this, these projects. I have to just do something about the food. I'm sorry guys, but you know that. I can't end this without a little bit of food. The two things, the two things I wanna praise and sing their praises are the hummus, which is real, authentic, and delicious, and amazing. And this is how you serve it. You serve it with a well, and then in the well, you put all sorts of yummy things, in this case, tahina and a 24-hour boiled egg and extra um, chickpeas. And on the right, I must sing the praises of Israeli tomatoes. There is nothing like them in the world. And what else do I love about Israeli food? On the left are Arab pastries. They are so decadent and delicious, and they're nothing like anything you can eat anywhere. And the very sad news for everyone here tonight is that I actually have a box this big of Arab pastries that I was bringing to tonight's slideshow when it was supposed to be in March. And on the right, my favorite thing you can get in Israel that you can't get anywhere else in the world, kosher for Passover, peanut butter. Only for Sephardim, of course, or those who eat keep me out. The amazing goat's cheese, the amazing olive oil. This on the bottom right is an olive oil um, family that's been doing it, as you can see, 150 years of olive oil in the same family. And above them, the oldest olive trees we've ever seen, thousands and thousands of years old. It was amazing, a privilege to be able to stand among those trees. 
my favorite names of stores on the upper right, a bakery called Hamotzi Lechem. What a great name for a bakery. On the bottom, a, um, a bar that serves this great drink called Holy Water. Um, and on the left, a store whose name is Kan Sagor B'Shabbat, Shabbat Shalom. The name of the store is, this store is closed on Shabbat. That's the name of the store. I love it. Where else can you get etrog gin? Etrog infused gin was fantastic. And where else can you get wine with the name Derech Eretz? Now, the word Derech Eretz in Hebrew means good manners. So we love bringing a bottle of wine to our Israeli friends and saying, just what you need, good manners. <laughs> wine called good manners. Of course, the sunset skies, nothing like them in the world. You don't have to go to the Caribbean. This is the view of the sunset from two blocks away from my apartment. I just wanna end with some familiar faces. I got the opportunity to see every one of City Shul's Shin Shinin, every one of them. This group came for Shabbat lunch to our apartment. It was just so fantastic. You remember them all. We saw them all. We had experiences with all of them. It was absolutely so special. So special to see them all. We had the best time. And these, my friends, are our new Shin Shinim, if we have the privilege of them coming from Israel for next year. Tal and Matar, which means the dew and the rain. They're a perfect pair. Okay, last but not least, why do I love Tel Aviv in the winter? Do I need to say more? And my favorite piece of graffiti here. It's not perfect, but it's all yours. That's how I feel. Thank you all to everybody. This is always so much fun. I always enjoy this so much. Um, and I'm, I'm just glad everybody came. And if you wanna just go on gallery view and say goodbye to me, I'd love to see you all.